Okay, today we have a lot to cover, so I'd like to begin. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are, and welcome to the HyperJest third round announcement of Opportunity webinar. Uh, we will be having two sessions today, and yeah, you're here for the morning session of uh, European time, so welcome. Um, before we begin, uh, first of all, please use the chat box to ask any questions. Please do not raise your hand. We won't be able to deactivate uh, the microphones for you, but if you have any questions or comments, please address them in the chat box. We will have a dedicated Q&A session at the end, but you don't have to wait until then. Um, if you have anything, uh, throw it in when uh, you want to ask. Um, the second is please answer our questionnaire that we will be putting in the chat box later on. My colleague Wemben and I, we will both be active in the chat, providing you with useful links. And there we will be providing you with a link to our questionnaire form. We would really like to hear your feedback and yeah, hear your honest opinion on our webinars. So yeah, um, please make sure to answer the questionnaire form before you leave. And last but not least, if you are on social media, please use the hashtag access to space for all and hyperjust. Uh, follow, like, and share UNUSA. Um, we are active on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. So all of you are here to learn a bit more about HyperJust. It is a, a cooperation between the European Space Agency and UNUSA, which was established in 2019. And the aim is to provide educational research institutes with opportunities to conduct a series of hypergravity experiments at the Large Diameter Centrifuge Facility at the European Space Research and Technology Center, ESTEC. And the LDC allows samples to be exposed in acceleration forces of one to 20 times Earth's gravity. Um, the experiment series consists of one or one to two weeks. So you will have fully two weeks um, at the LDC for on-site experiment, but of, of course the integration preparation and the uh, things you need to do after that. The first round awardee was from Thailand and they will be testing the effect of hypergravity and water meal as a possible food source for space exploration. They will be having uh, this experiment later in the year. And also we selected two teams uh, for the second round. One was from Macau that will analyze uh, the medical and biotechnology logical potential of fungi for future space exploration as well, and from Bolivia, uh, which will examine the breakup of human red blood cells um, to get a better un understanding of anemia in space. So as you can see um, through HyperJess, uh, you can do biology and medical related uh, experiments as well. But of course, there are so many different types of science and technology that can be tested. Um, my colleague from ESA will be explaining a bit more about that. But if you want to learn more about uh, what our different awardees have been doing, please take a look at our awardee pages. So you go to UNUSA Access to Space for All, and then on the top of the Access to Space for All page, you will find a place called Partners. Uh, sorry, awardees. And if you click our awardees, it will take you to a list of uh, our awardees. And for HyperJust, please click on the HyperJust awardees, and then you will see the three teams that I've explained already. Macau and Bolivia were just selected a few months ago, so we might not have too much content there. But for the uh, Thailand team, we have a few um, information there already. And yeah, the teams will be posting more. So uh, please, yeah, take a look. And also look at our other awardees as well. They might give you some ideas ideas. Um, to give you more ideas on what you could do through HyperJess and hypergravity, I just also want to emphasize a webinar series that we were doing in the past called Conducting R&D in Hypergravity and Microgravity. Um, this was nine webinars uh, which covered the whole fundamental and technical knowledge on the benefits of conducting R&D in hypergravity and microgravity. So why is this uh, modified gravity environment special? And and what's so amazing about it, uh, what type of R&D can be done in this special uh, hypergravity and microgravity um, uh, environment. So with examples from life science, physical science and technology demonstration and all that. And of course, we uh, explained about the existing available platforms, opportunities and networks. So please have a look at these this webinar series as well. I think it can give you a good uh, overview of what can be done in hypergravity and microgravity and yeah, the different types of activities that other people are doing. So with this, um, I'd already like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Jack Van Loon from the European Space Agency to give you an overview about ESA, ESTEC, and yeah, um, the LDC facility. So with this, I'd like to give the floor to Jack.
Great. So I want to tell you something about the ESA launch, the Amateur Centrifuge, the LDC, with respect to the HyperJS uh, uh, program. For those not familiar with ESA, ESA is uh, the European Space Agency, which was founded in 1975 with 10 uh, founding member states uh, within Europe. And in 2020, we are at uh, 22 um, uh, regular member states. There are some candidate member states and some affiliated member states, but this is where we are uh, at the moment. It's a distributed space agency, which means that uh, you have various activities in uh, throughout Europe. Uh, headquarters of ESA is in, in, in France, in Paris. You have facilities in Rome, in Noordwijk, Estec. This is where the uh, centrifuge is. We have the crew operations in Darmstadt, uh, the astronaut center in Cologne. You have facilities in Madrid, in Oxfordshire, in Redu, and uh, the launch facilities in French Guinea and Co. What I said, the ESA launch, the amateur centrifuge, is at Estec, ESA Estec in the Netherlands. Uh, here you see the, uh, the Estec uh, um, uh, premises, really on the edge of the country with respect to the sea. These are the dunes, and the, the, the light part at the top is the sea. But of course, the most important part is the center of gravity here is uh, the little dome you see here in the center of the image where the uh, large amateur centrifuge is located. For the centrifuge and doing hypergravity research, uh, why should we do that sort of research? Well, we have some webinars as mentioned before, but to have a, a, a quick explanation of what we do in, in gravity related research, here is the gravity spectrum going from uh, microgravity to XG, uh, never zero gravity does not exist in our solar system. Um, and if you want to say something about gravity, I think you should explore the full spectrum from nearly no gravity to you know, a very high gravity, whatever the high is for your respective um, uh, materials. For low gravity situations, for everything below 1G, uh, you can use the ISS or the CSS or free flyer uh, facilities and uh, to generate partial G. So, for instance, Moon or Mars G, which is very um, uh, interesting at the moment, you can use uh, in flight uh, centrifuge to do that. All work above 1G you can do on the ground and you can make use of centrifuges and in our case it's the uh, large diameter centrifuge. You see the large diameter centrifuge rotating um, but the sort of research you can do in such a facility if we can go to the next yeah um, is this is a bit image you saw before is um, you explore the full spectrum as I explained to you before but you can also make use of the centrifuge uh, to, uh, for instance, look into launch simulations, also high Gs, parabolic flight. You have parabolic flight um, uh, profiles where part of the uh, of the profile is at hyper G. Well, this is only for depending on the flight, let's say 15, 20 seconds or so. Um, you can have a longer hyper G period in the uh, in the centrifuge to explore what happens, uh, what happens over there. And of course, your regular hypergravity research. But you can also make use of the centrifuge to explore um, the gravity continuum, which means that if you do an experiment under high G conditions, so everything above 1G, uh, you do a series of experiments. And here we take an easy one. Uh, you do a series of experiments at high and, and you go to 1G and then with this data you can extrapolate and uh, model to see what might be expected if you go to a lower G uh, condition. And this, this, this relationship might be linear as you see here or some sort of exponential uh, relationship, but anyhow you can make use of centrifuges to say something of what might happen if you go for instance to Mars or Moon to what might happen at the lower G uh, condition. There's one way of using the centrifuges um, to simulate what happens at lower G. The other way is the reduced gravity paradigm. And if you look at the upper panel here, this is a regular microgravity experiment where we are on ground on Earth at 1G. Um, and then we launch our samples and then you are under microgravity conditions. And then you have a microgravity response and the adaptation time uh, of your sample. If you do that same thing, in a centrifuge, so you start, for instance, at 3G and you have a steady state situation and then you lower the G level to either 2 or, or 1G, you also have a reduced uh, gravity at that point in time and you also have adaptation to this lower uh, gravity situation. And the paradigm here is, is that these two 
um, uh, responses are similar. Not the same, but similar. So making use of centrifuges, you might already work on what might happen if you go into real microgravity conditions. And on all these pages, you see reference to, um, to peer review papers you can go to and read more about it. This is the lab. I showed you the dome already in the earlier uh, images. Here you see the dome again. Uh, you see it here in the, um, the floor plan. This is the rest of the lab. Um, if we go from, uh, from this side, we have a meeting room and a small workbench. We have a clean room, um, you know, to work with very clean materials if needed, um, a support uh, area, um, a kitchen and so on. We have a wet analysis lab where we have various instruments uh, on the LCMS or um, uh, um, freezers, coolers and so on. We have a, a big life sciences lab where we have microscopes, flow benches, incubators and so on. A support lab where we have uh, autoclaves, water, different kinds of water, uh, chemicals, and so on. Um, we have a, a preparation lab, which is at various uh, parts. We have a part of the ESA life sciences or life support system uh, facility. The Melissa is part in there. We also have part now dedicated to in situ research utilization. The FFC facility is in this lab. And then we have the gravity preparation lab here where we also have clinostats for microgravity simulation or a random persisting machine also for microgravity simulation. And of course, you have the, uh, the LDC. Some images of, um, of, um, of the various parts. This is the main lab where you see the incubators and the flow benches, workbenches and so on. Meeting room and small workbench here. Uh, the wet lab, um, you know, with various instruments, shakers and so on. Support lab, minus 80 freezers if needed, uh, autoclaves, um, uh, millicule and, and demi water. The LDC preparation room where you see here the LDC at the background. Here we have the computer to to uh, to control the LDC, and this is the, the screen used by the um, by the scientist to monitor and command your experiment inside the gondola. And then we have the LDC preparation lab and a small workbench. The main characteristics of the large diameter centrifuge, it has a diameter of eight meter when fully swing out. It has four arms um, at G levels. Uh, we can vary uh, per arm at various locations. We can put the gondola so you can have various G locations at, um, um, in one arm. We have seven, uh, uh, six rotating gondolas and one gondola in the center and the one in the center um, uh, can be used as a control, especially for rotation control. It's a swing out system, which means that the gravity factor is always perpendicular to the floor of the um, of the gondola. Each gondola can hold 80 kilograms of payload. Uh, we can go up to 20 times Earth gravity, 20 times a fully loaded uh, in a fully loaded system. A 22 kilowatt um, 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 motor is running the system, and as I explained before, uh, you can have for this hyperjet program a maximum of two weeks uh, use of the LDC in the lab. Within the gondola, we have various facilities for the experiments, uh, temperature sensors, analog, digital, and PUE video channels, RS-233 serial communication. Um, we have an ethernet channel, uh, USB 3, USB 2.3 channels, of course, power uh, supply. We have fixation points if needed. We have gas lines and water supply to the experiments if needed. I'm not going to explain this image. You can uh, find it in in the PDF from this uh, from this um, presentation, but also in the LDC user manual where you see the um, uh, URL link here. This is uh, to explain the connections we have between the rotating part of the LDC and the static part of the LDC and the various connections you have um, within the system. Again, this is to explain the um, swing out of the gondola where you have uh, earth gravity here, you have the acceleration of the centrifuge here, and this is the resultant um, g-force you have on the sample. If you develop a payload for the uh, for the LDC in the gondola, please note that there is the the, the you know the the, the volume of the uh, of the gondola, but also the size of the door you have to uh, take into account. And also, please take into account the hinges you have. So, don't make a too large payload that just fits in the door. You know, take some margin so things can easily be um, accommodated. There's also a base plate when something can be um, bolded to, although most of the time it's not needed. And you have gas and fluid containers which can be uh, put here. So, if you need a certain gas uh, while rotation, that is possible. 
if you have a sample uh, in the uh, LDC in the gondola, always put the, the let's say the main part of the sample exactly in the center of the um, of the gondola. That's where you have the best um, uh, simulation of hypergravity. If you deviate from the center, um, you get a more um, let's say more artifacts related to shear forces for instance and the different g level uh, in these locations of the gondola so please keep keep it in the center and as low as possible in the um, um, in the gondola and here you see some um, uh, although the ldc is pretty hard pretty large i mean you try to to get the best uh, results as possible and that is in the center and as low as possible in the gondola an example of the LDC uh, spin-up time, it takes about 60 seconds to go from 1G to 20G, uh, and it takes about, well, 55, a bit less seconds to go from um, 20G to 1G. And this is just an example of a profile. This is a Soyuz launch profile, but you can make any, any profile needed for your particular experiment, so we can program that, and that is then executed during the run of your, uh, of your study. Some examples of M uh, LDC accommodations. This is an experiment uh, where you can see that you can make use of these two gondolas, which means two G levels, and it's a factor two about. So if this gondola runs at 10 G, this one can run at 5 G, so you get uh, two G levels at the same run. We can have different temperatures in the, in the gondola, so with incubators here um, at 37 degrees, for instance, to do cellular work. If your payload is too large that it won't fit into one gondola, we can have the essential part of your payload to sample in there and then the supporting equipment in, in uh, supporting or next um, uh, gondola next, uh, next to the first one. And that can be um, connected by, by cables and, and, and you know, for power or, or communication. You can also make use of the lab to set up your experiment in the, uh, in the lab and then the whole thing is uh, accommodated to the LDC uh, later on. Here is some example of in situ research utilization studies done. Uh, uh, this is an example of a regolith experiment. Actually, this is a, a, a gun we used within the uh, within the LDC, and this is a, a box of regolith. So the projectile is fired onto the box at different G levels, and uh, you can see what gravity does to the to the impact um, uh, at various G levels. You can test it also, the LDC can be used for testing habitat structure because there's a scaling effect at high Gs uh, where the length is scaled to one to the, uh, you know, to the number of length, but the time is scaled squared and the mass is scaled uh, to the power of three. So, um, you know, when doing experiment in the LDC, you can do shorter experiments and simulate what happens at, uh, you know, at, at, at longer times and at higher, uh, uh, higher loads. This is explained to you before, so you can extrapolate data, um, you know, by these experiments. And this is a good example of that. This is a, a drill, an ultrasonic drill. This was from the University of Glasgow, where they uh, had a model to describe the function of that grill when it would have been used at a different uh, celestial body at, with different G. So we. Uh, did some various experiments with um, a series of G levels and, and measured the function of the drill, the power com uh, super, uh, power consumption and the efficacy of the drill and so on. And this is what you can see here is on the dotted lines, you see the model they made before they came to the LDC. So the model they had, um, you know, based on their calculations. And after the experiments, this is uh, this is what you see with the actual result of the um, of the function of these um, of these drills. So you see that it is a, a, a big difference between the model and the test uh, results. So they really had to adapt their um, you know their model for um, this ultrasonic drill. There's some examples here. Uh, you see, if you see closely, you saw the the impact of the regolith here. Um, we also used um, uh, the LDC to look into the vestibular system of a crab. We did mass and, lots of mass and heat transfer experiments also to cool facilities there. Planetary glacier um, uh, models we used to see how glacier, glaciers uh, function at different G levels. Bubble generation, we had five cameras looking at the experiment. This is an experiment we did with zebrafish in the LDC and also the same experiment we did in, in the Kleinerstadt. And this is a setup of a couple of experiments with an EVOS M7000 fluorescent microscope in the uh, in the centrifuge, or a light seat microscope, which can also be used in the centrifuge. And finally, this one is a, a drop. Uh, this is not working anymore. A drop, um, um, a bubble which was formed on the high G and went to the surface of the um, 
of the fluid. This is uh, one of the last pages um, of the presentation. Here you see uh, uh, all uh, studies done which have been published in peer-reviewed papers uh, on, on geology, on technology, material sciences, cell biology, so they are uh, categorized here. They are all DOIs um, linked to the peer-reviewed uh, papers you can go to. So the HyperJest proposal, what should be clear, uh, clearly addressed in these proposals. Uh, clear is why you want to use the LDC. Use the LDC for regular hypergravity studies, for launch simulations or low gravity ex uh, extrapolations, microgravity simulations to reduce gravity paradigm, for instance. Science and application of background and rationale should be clearly stated in your uh, proposal. Also see where there is preliminary data of whatever you want to study, either from your own or from literature. Uh, and use extended references to um, to show that, and also identify the duration of your experiment and the setup a bit, and again, the maximum of two weeks you can use the LDC. How to use the LDC, identify what parameters to measure and how you want to measure them, either online or post-exposure, and the expected outcome of the study. Show a preliminary hardware configuration, if you have it, if not, um, at least describe what you intend to do. Uh, think about the schedule and logistics, how you want to perform the experiment and how you do the logistics also for transportation of your materials from your home country to the LDC. How to communicate to your results, report peer-reviewed papers and, and conferences and so forth, and also the outreach, so um, social media and so on. And before upload uh, your proposal to the UNOSA um, uh, website, recheck all the parts of your proposal, whether they are completed and uh, filled out satisfied. Here you have some more uh, links uh, to the LDC user manual, the list lab, so the lab where the LDC part of uh, Selgra, the, the student um, part of the European Long Gravity Research Association, there you find some lectures as well. You have a series of webinars uh, from UNOSA, as just mentioned, and the ESA education program as well. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jack, for the overview of ESA, STEC, and yeah, the LDC facility. That was a lot of information, but don't worry, everyone. Um, the presentations are already on our website. Um, I think my colleague Wenbin just shared it in the chat, but yeah, it's under HyperJest webinar. So if you want to download and have a look, especially at the useful links that uh, uh, Jack provided at the end, yeah, please have a look. OK, with this, I'd like to move on to talking a bit in detail about the actual announcement of opportunity document and the application form. So um, all of you are already here, which means that you successfully registered. So I think all of you know where to find all these documents, but I'm just going to go over it. So the easiest way is to search access to space for all. It will take you to our index page, but of course you can go to the top UNUSA website, click on access to space for all. There's a, a big icon in the middle of the web page. And then when you press on access to space for all, you will get to this index page on the left. There you will have to click the hypergravity and microgravity Gravity track. That's where HyperJest is organized under. So please click the hypergravity and microgravity track, then click on HyperJest under the hands on component. Now, under the education component, you can find the HyperJest webinars and the hypergravity and microgravity webinar series. So that's where you can get the webinar information as well. But for now, um, if you click on HyperJest, it will take you to the HyperJest index page, which you can see on the left hand side. And then you will scroll down a bit and go to this rounds page. This is the most important page and basically um, this is where we will be updating all of the things related to this hypergest third round um, I would just like to emphasize again that the documents here are all really, really important. Please have a careful look at all of these documents here. So on the top are the announcement of opportunity documents. The first one is announcement of opportunity. This is the PDF that you definitely need to read, so please have a look. Below that is the expression of interest form. I will be explaining that later on. It's a document. This is not mandatory, but this is a form that you can submit to us if you're interested in having a technical consultation session. The third one is the application form. This is mandatory. If you want to apply to HyperJest, you need to uh, fill this in. So uh, definitely um, please make sure to read it carefully. And then the fourth one is the evaluation table. It's an Excel spreadsheet where it explains um, how we're going to score your application. So it has the values that we're looking at and um, the numbers, uh, so please have a look at that if you want to have an understanding of how your application will be scored. 
Under that are the reference materials. So we have the ESA Large um, Diamond Center Food Summary. So it goes to ESA's website. The LDC User Manual. This is one of the most important documents to propose something, um, to propose an experiment in Hypergest. You need to understand what the gondola size is, what it can do, um, the different uh, specifics about the LDC. You would need to find all the information here. So please read this document. Um, it is one of the most important documents. I cannot emphasize the importance enough. Um, the other documents are the LDC technical, sorry, the technical, uh, oh, sorry. This document is also important. And then we have the example of the past uh, experiments here. This will give you a good idea on what you can do. And then, of course, we jump to our UNUSA webinars that we have been explaining earlier. So I think if you have a good look at all of this, you will get a good understanding of what you can do uh, and yeah, what um, and get ideas and connect with what you want to do um, through HyperJess. So this is what the schedule looks like. Um, the announcement of opportunity was open on the 31st of May. Now you're here today for the um, announcement of opportunity webinar. Now the next step is this is not mandatory, but if you're interested, you can submit an expression of interest form and it is a one pager and uh, all you have to do is, is uh, give us an idea of what you want to do uh, with HyperJess. And then if you submit that by the 30th of July, we will uh, schedule a technical consultation with your team during the summer, so August and September, um, to each team that uh, throws, in an app, uh, throws in an expression of interest. And the technical consultation will be around 30 minutes, and it will be with Issei and Yunusa, and we will be giving you feedback and also tips on how to uh, yeah, get your idea together or what you would need to consider. So if you're worried or if you have, if you just want to ask us if your experiment is, let's say, feasible or not, yeah, please throw in a expression of interest form by the 30th of July, so the end of next month. Basically, you have another month. And then in the very end, please submit your completed application form on the 12th of November. Yeah, this is the deadline. After that, uh, UNUSA and uh, ESA will be going over the application forms uh, during November and December, February, uh, November, December, January. And then we hope to announce the selection results around February 2024. When you're selected, uh, your yeah, a whole bunch of activities begins. The first will be the preparation phase from March so you will be going through, um, I would say, monthly meetings with us um, to see the development. And at some point, we will uh, have a review in the sense of uh, we give you a go with the manufacturing and then you will actually put together um, your experiment. And then Q4 is the actual experiment phase. So uh, we have set it as Q4, so between October, November, December of uh, 2024. However, let's say if your uh, experiment is actually already done or could be completed earlier, we can also uh, have it earlier in the year. So this will be up to uh, discussion between your team, uh, ISA and UNUSA. But basically you will have uh, a few months to prepare and then have the experiment phase. Now after that is the reporting phase, so you will have until the 31st of January 2025 to put together a final report of um, yeah the results of the actual uh, experiment. And of course, on the top, as you can see, we have the outreach and publication phase. So when you are selected as an awardee, this phase begins in the sense of we would really like you to maximize uh, the effects of HyperJest. It is a capacity building opportunity, but we don't want to keep it just between us and the university. We want you to maximize it so that you can reach the younger generation, you can reach the public to get uh, more people to understand um, the impacts of space, the benefits of using space, and yeah, especially uh, experimentation in hypergravity. So we really, we really urge you to do as much for outreach and publication. So uh, applying to international conferences, putting together reports and all that. So yeah, we urge you to do the whole phase when it also begins. And yeah, it will keep on going after the reporting phase as well, because as long as you are uh, mentioning uh, the results of HyperJest, you would need to let us know. And of course, we would be happy to promote that as well. 
So I'm just going to pick up the important parts of the announcement of opportunity document. Um, I would just like to say, please read this section um, on the eligibility criteria. Uh, so 12 uh, very carefully, but just to emphasize, the entities that are eligible are the ones located in developing economies and economies in transition. Um, this is a classification by the World Economic and Situation Prospects Report uh, by the United Nations. Uh, we have put a link into the AO document, so please have a look. If you don't know where your country, uh, which uh class your country is classified and please take a look um there's a list and it's very clear second the entities that are uh, eligible are government organizations research institutes universities and other public and non-for-profit organizations now this does not mean that we uh we don't want people to have partnerships. Uh, we are really encouraging partnerships, and it's okay if you want to partner, let's say, uh, with a commercial company or space agency um, from a spacefaring nation that is not eligible. So what we would like to ask you is that for your team, the team members, they all have to be um, people from these eligible entities that I've mentioned earlier. So government organizations, research institutes, universities, and other uh, public and nonprofit organizations from these uh, developing economies and economies in transition. However, you are, we are welcoming you to have partnerships with anyone who would help you realize your experiment. So in that case, Please don't put them in your team, but um, put them as external support. So in the application form, there is a different section um, explaining uh, your partnerships uh, within the team. So if it's a team that's formed of different entities, you have a place to write that. But also if you have this external partnership, or external support, you have a section to write that. So please make sure that you divide uh, these things very clearly. And for the team, uh, we have it right there, it says one team leader and three team members. Um, this is the amount of team members we are able to fund, so give funding to. Um, if you want to have a larger team, that is fine. However, you would need to find uh, the support for them yourselves. Uh, we are only funding this one team leader and three team members for the travel uh, to the Netherlands and their accommodation. So if you are able to collect funding for, let's say, an extra two team members, that is totally fine. Um, yeah, we leave that part up to you. Uh, number 13 is the selection criteria. Um, we have basically four major points. The first one is the experiment content. This was explained earlier by Jack as well, but we will be valuing the educational, scientific, and technological value of your experiment and the relevance of the utilization of the LDC facility, why you need to use hypergravity and why you want to use the LDC facility. You would need to uh, justify that. And of course, the details of the experiment as well as the data acquisition, data analysis plan, and the proposed experiment. So that would be worth 25 percent. The next part is team composition. So we will be looking at the skill set, the organization, and the composition of the team. And the team members really have to demonstrate from their experience the competence in scientific and technological research or in education, and as well as project management. And the team composition of proposals with the same score uh, will be compared, and a proposal with a larger number of women will be ranked higher. We are really trying to encourage more participation of females in our access to space for all opportunities. Therefore, if we have more women on the team, uh, you will be ranked higher. Um, this is 30% of the score. The next part is feasibility, basically decide, um, divided into two parts. Um, the first one is the general feasibility of the proposal experiment. So um, can we actually do this experiment in the LDC? Does it make sense? Uh, what is what you're proposing? Is your plan uh, feasible? Is it uh, doable within the two weeks? The next part is the budget plan. So do you have the funding that you need to make this experiment possible for you? So those are the two main scores that we will be looking at, and this is worth 25%. And last but not least is the outreach. As I explained earlier, HyperJazz is a capacity building opportunity, and we really hope that everyone uh, does this outreach to really uh, communicate and disseminate the benefits of hypergravity experimentation and really promote STEM education. And this will be clearly, uh, this will need to be clearly linked with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development. So please have a look at the SDGs website. And yeah, this will be uh, 20. 
20% of your score. Green is the financial and technical support. So UNUSA will be funding round trip tickets between your country, uh, the Netherlands, and of course back for one team leader and three team members. ESA will be paying for the accommodation, so the hotel for the one team leader and three team members. They will also be providing technical support on site and any costs related to the use of the facility. So basically uh, um, the access of the facility for two weeks is funded by ESA. So the awardee team, all you need to do is uh, find the costs related to the preparation, development, transportation to the Netherlands, so the shipping of your experiment, insurance and outreach activities. These are the costs that you would need for uh, participating in HyperJest. For publications, as I've mentioned earlier, um, whenever you um, uh, put out uh, the results of uh, the HyperJest experiment, uh, please make sure to include this. I just want to mention this again because this uh, publication phase is the long, uh, the outreach and publication phase is the longest and yeah, uh, we would re really like to maximize um, the visibility of HyperJust as well. So with this, we will uh, uh, move on to the expression of interest form part. Um, I just want to mention again that for the expression of interest, the people who are, are eligible can send in this application form. It's a, it's a one pager, it's a very short document and you just really need to briefly explain your intended experiment, uh, use clear language, graphs and tables. It's a one pager, you won't have uh, time to write a novel about it. So please uh, provide us with concise information and yeah, do not exceed one page. So yeah, it's not mandatory and the tips are to read the documents first. Please look at all the documents first. Um, we will be uh, checking that you did that and yeah, please submit on time. So with this, I'd like to give the floor to my colleague Wenbin Zhang, who will be giving you an explanation of the application form. Um, I know um, that uh, it will be a lot of information, but please uh, download the application form itself and um, have a look at it. And yeah, I give the floor to Wenbin now. Um, thank you, Hazuki. Uh, yes, uh, as Hazuki mentioned that uh, these are uh, uh, application form is already on our website. Um, if you have that in your hands, please open it and I will go through this uh, um, actually everything in the application form to explain some details uh, that you have to notice. So uh, first I would like to start from the chapter one, which is team composition. Um, I'm sorry, uh, chapter one should be the basic information. Um, yeah, so the executive summary here, it should be um, in this part, you have to summarize uh, the full part in the application form, which is uh, chapter four, chapter six, seven, and eight. So uh, you have to summarize uh, why you choose to perform this experiment and what are expected outcomes, uh, why your experiment is unique, and uh, also explain your plan, including your schedule, your uh, budget, and also your communication and dissemination plan. Um, as my colleague mentioned, is important for us. And in the 1.3 certificate part, uh, please note this certificate is not the letter of endorsement because uh, in the past we have received some application form that only um, signed in this form, but didn't provide a letter of endorsement. So uh, please know that a written letter of endorsement is also required. Okay, so next part will be the team composition. Um, yeah, as my uh, colleague Hazuki mentioned, we, uh, we can support one team leader and three team members to uh, to to fly to Netherlands and uh, we uh, also ESA support the accommodations for them. Uh, and those uh, team leader and team members have to be from the eligible entities, which is from the developing countries. So if you have some uh, external support from like developed country or some commercial um, companies, so they must uh, include it in uh, they must not include it in the team members, but they could include in the external support. Okay, so next part will be the proposal technical abstract. So yeah, this technical abstract is 
actually um, is kind of a, like a mini uh, proposal. So it means through this abstract, you should be able to answer several questions. So uh, why you choose to perform this experiment and how the hypergravity environment helps your experiment and what are these uh, expected outcome from your experiment. So basically, uh, explain it to us, what is your experiment, why you do this, and how you're going to do this. Yeah. So please use uh, like clear and concise text to explain all this um, um, in a maximum of uh, 300 words. OK, so next one should be the chapter four, the experiment objectives and the expected outcomes. Um, this part is uh, actually you have to explain all these uh, your experiment rationale and uh, um, yeah why you do this. So um, yeah, in this part, uh, please clearly and concisely state the scientific and the technical or um, educational value of your experiment, um, including what is the theoretical basis and uh, the hypothesis on the effect of hypergravity and why this hypothesis is reasonable and uh, how this experiment support your research. So let me use a like simple um, example to explain. So for example, I'm, I'm trying to conducting a study on the influence of centrifugal uh, force on the magnetic field of a maglev equipment like magnet, uh, maglev train. So I may want to perform the ex uh, experiment in the centrifuge and to simulate a uh, maglev train who uses a um, mechanism to levitate trains on the tracks. And the maglev train that enters a groove at a very high speed, like uh, more than uh, 400 kilometers, uh, yeah, 400 kilometers per hour, uh, will be subject to a uh, centrifugal force um, of about several G. Um, yeah. So those are my uh, experimental rationale. And then I assume that the hypergravity causes change in the magnetic field, which is my um, hypothesis. But yeah, this is a just example. So please make sure to uh, explain more that support your hypothesis. Um, so next part would be the yeah, experiment objectives. So uh, please uh, use SMART criteria to define your uh, objectives. So it means uh, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bounded. And in my example, so my first objective is to measure the magnetic field uh, distribution near the maglev devices um, before the experiment, which is uh, yeah, 1G. And my second objective is to measure the same parameters at 3G, at 4, uh, 5G, and 10G. So I can uh, do some comparison uh, according to those data. So um, yeah, it's a very clear, clear objectives and uh, measurable. So please also remember to use SMART criteria to explain your uh, objectives. And next part will be the foreseen outcomes. So in this part, please state the possible effects of hypergravity on the experiment, on your experiment. So the results should be whether directly observed or through a data or sample analysis. So also in my example, I foresee that the equipment used to simulate a maglev train uh, deflects under the influence of the hypergravity, so causing changes in the magnetic field. So in the picture, you can see the, the magnetic field, yeah, like, um, yeah, deflected. So uh, also in the 4.4, so this is a novelty, uniqueness, and the possible evolution. So in this part, please state clearly and concisely why is your experiment unique or special? So why should we give this a uh, uh, chance to perform the experiment um, to you, but not to other teams? OK, so next one, 5.1. So chapter 5 is basically about the experiment 
um, specifications and description is very technical part. Um, so 5.1 is the main specifications. So in this part, you can use graphs and tables to explain uh, the main specifications. So th in this part, please let us know what your experiment looked like, um, especially the weight and the maximum dimensions of the uh, equipment. So please note, if your experiment include a deployable unit, please consider the maximum dimensions of the equipment. And please read the user guide to check the capacity of the gondola, um, the link that um, Jack already shared in his presentation. So please read those uh, user guide. And the second will be the expected uh, experiment environment and conditions. So in this part, please describe the experimental environment or conditions required for your experiment, such as um, on what level of uh, G level that you want to use and the, the duration that the experiment will be explosive um, so that uh, in that uh, hypergravity environment. So in this section, please let us know that what kind of uh, uh, condition that we are going to provide for your experiment. So, um, and including, um, for example, how many gondolas you want to use. As Jack mentioned, they have um, six gondolas in total. So how many gondolas you want to use and uh, maybe other specific conditions, for example, uh, the temperature and uh, yeah, uh, maybe you want to use two gondolas uh, on the same arm to uh, connect them together. And the next part will be the 5.3, which is the design requirement. So this design requirement is for your experiment, right? So please describe the design requirement of the, your ex uh, experimental setup including your um, samples, uh, control equipment, data acquisition system, um, et cetera. So then we will know uh, whether your experiment is feasible. So uh, for example, a good uh, and reasonable design can help you to understand uh, what techniques and what materials will be used in your equipment. It's also good for planning the schedule and budget and we recommend you to read, uh, read through the user menu and to see the interface between your equipment and the gondola. And next part will be 5.4, which is the experiment design definition. So in this section, please use the block diagram and the descriptive text to explain all the equipment for the experiment. So please don't just uh, put one um, block diagram here. Please also explain your diagram because sometimes your design could be a little bit complicated. So uh, try to explain it to us and it help us and also help you to understand your design well. So also if there is a control group as part of the equipment, please describe it together. And next part will be 5.5, which is uh, experiment materials. So please list the material to be used in the experiment. This is an optional uh, question here, but um, if your ex uh, experiment is um, regarding the um, biological um, samples like um, animals or plants, uh, please list the, the samples to be used. And for 5.6 is an uh, experiment procedure. So please use a block diagram or flow chart um, to, to explain the method and the procedure of the equipment. So uh, what are your uh, equipment? Uh, for example, you have some actions inside the gondola. Um, in any case, you may have to uh, for example, stop the uh, experiment and bring your equipment out of the gondola. And uh, yeah, if some case you have to mention that in the uh, flow chart. Yeah. 
And next part will be the 5.7, which is the data acquisition system. So this part is uh, how you measure your objectives. So describe the method of acquiring data in the experiment and the equipment um, to collect the data. So please let us know how you will collect the data. And for example, uh, you may use the high-speed camera and maybe to uh, observe, and maybe you have to use some sensors like, uh, uh, for example, in my example, I have to install a lot of uh, magnetometers to measure the yeah, distribution of the magnetic field. So in this case, I have to use magnetometers. So please also clarify whether your team has the access to all this equipment. And if not, uh, whether your team intends to realize the data acquisition through external cooperation or procurement, please clarify that. And next part will be linked to the, the yeah, data acquisition system, the data analysis scheme. So in this part, um, please um, describe the method of the data analysis and the equipment required. Uh, for example, if you use sensors to collect data, you may only need like computer or softwares to an analyze your um, data. But in case uh, biological samples uh, are collected, then you may need a like biochemical laboratory to uh, analyze your uh, samples. So please also clarify whether your team has access to all the equipment. And if not, uh, whether you are going to realize the data analysis through external cooperation and procurement, please clarify. And the next part, 5.9, is the verification criteria. So in this part, please describe how the results of the experiment will verify the objectives of the yeah, your experiment and with the related verification method, and how to determine whether your experiment is successful. And next part is the last part of the uh, section five is the current status of the proposed exper uh, experiment. So in this part, um, yeah, it, this part is optional. So if your laboratory or your team already started the related research work, or you already achieved some outcomes um, in your research. Please describe the work your team has already done, um, including those uh, like theoretical fundings, uh, equipment uh, development, or uh, some preparation work. Um, so if you have not started the research yet, so don't worry because we don't judge teams. Um, based on their current status, but please note that we will evaluate the feasibility of the experiment. So um, according the schedule that my colleague Hazuki uh, introduced, so from uh, like March 2024 to the quarter four, so actually the development of the experiment um, will, is only within like eight to 10 months. So if one team that proposed a very complicated experiment, but without any prerequisite outcomes, so we may assume that this team is very hard to complete their experiment uh, following the schedule. So um, next part will be the yeah, planning. Um, yeah, this is about the the project management. So in the 6.1 de uh, development schedule, so please provide the uh, tentative schedule to develop and perform the experiment. So assume that we inform you that you'll win the opportunity to contact your uh, experiment on, um, in February 2024. So you have to plan your schedule from the kickoff meeting, which is maybe at the beginning of March 2024, and to the submission of the final report, which is January of 2025, and clarify the critical path. Um, the critical path is the longest path from the start to the finish. 
it indicates the minimum time necessary to complete the entire project. So defining the critical path is very helpful for the project, uh, project management because it allows you to estimate the total project duration and also the time that necessary to complete it um, each small task. So through this uh, capacity building event, we hope that every team, every applying team that can understand the whole pr project management process. And yes, please um, use a Gantt chart to uh, describe your schedule here. So yeah, the chap uh, section 6.2 is the on-site integration and the experiment schedule. So 6.1, we want you to describe the, the whole process, like 10 or 11 months, um, the schedule, how you will use the 10 and 11 months. But in section 6.2, we want you to um, detailed explain how you will you, uh, use the two weeks in Netherlands. Okay, so 6.3 is a work breakdown structure. So in this part, we ask applicants to include the work breakdown structure. So this is WBS is based on the uh, orders of tasks that must be completed um, to eventually uh, arrive at the yeah, Netherlands to perform your experiment. So basically making a work breakdown structure helps the team to visualize uh, the small tasks that you have to finish. So um, yeah, I don't know if you can see uh, very uh, clear in this uh, example. So the WBS is not, inc not just including the technical part, but also the project management part and outreach part. So uh, you have to break down all these tasks to a small task and uh, yeah, uh, allocate to all, uh, all allocate all these small tasks to your team members. Okay, so yeah, next part will be the six point four, the international transportation plan. Yes, for this part, uh, the team has to provide information concerning the transportation of the equipment and your customer uh, customer arrangement. To do that, so you should know that uh, what you are going to bring to Netherlands and you should check customers uh, for both your country and the Netherlands uh, because sending experiment and uh, also samples is more complicated than you think. You know, uh, you may want to bring the equipment uh, with you in the check-in luggage or yeah, uh, onboard luggage. So, uh, but last year, uh, I will tell you that our job test awardee, um, their luggage didn't arrive uh, um, at Bremen with them, but was delayed um, a few weeks. So they had to make something with the limited resource they can access. So this is just one, um, one example that something might happen. So please consider everything that uh, possible and you have to plan everything in advance. Okay, so yeah, next chapter will be the chapter seven is budget. So 7.1 uh, in this part, please provide information on the cost. Uh, estimate the cost as precisely as possible. We understand it's very hard to make a, uh, one hundred percent accurate uh, plan, but try to consider everything that costs money. And please remember that Yunwusa and Yisa will pay for the international air tickets and accommodations for up to four people, one team leader and three team members. So uh, you don't have to consider that part in your budget plan, but you have to cover all the other all the other uh, related um, things like preparation, like development and transportation, uh, insurance, outreach activities. And yeah, if you uh, want to bring an um, extra person. And uh, yes, if the team 
um, as I mentioned before, if you don't have all of these uh, data acquisition system and data analysis uh, equipment, and you may have to consider uh, some budget for, for that. Um, okay, so next part will be 7.2. So budget source and uh, expected budget source. So uh, please provide information on the secured budget um, and information on the envisaged funding source of any remain budget. So for example, in the figure, I can, um, yeah, this is a just example that maybe a team that have like 25% of the budget from the college and other 20% 20, 20 budget from the external support, maybe from governmental support for a research project. And also through the crowdfunding, the team has raised like 15% of the fund. So now this team, they have like 60% uh, of the funding. And so this team will have to explain the uh, other 40% uh, uh, where they expected the source from. So also if uh, the most of the budget is not secured and the team cannot convince the selection committee that they can uh, secure the funding in the upcoming months. So this selection um, committee might think that this team is risky because they cannot secure funding and the feasibility of this team may be lower than other teams. So therefore, if you analyze your budget and you find most of the budget is not secured, I would suggest that you uh, review back to your uh, project uh, plan budget a budget plan and to see whether there is something that can be shortened. So anyway, making a reasonable uh, budget plan is important for the project management. Okay. Uh, and next part will be the chapter eight. Uh, yes, um, this is the communication and dissemination plan. So in this part, we ask the team to provide a plan that will be used to promote your experiment and your results, as well as um, your communication towards the general public. So your plan should be able to answer the following questions. I listed on the right hand side, uh, what kind of uh, outreach activities you would do to enhance your outcomes and what is your target audience and uh, what is the time frame for the different out reach activities you have planned and what the resources and platforms will you use. Okay, so uh, we received some feedbacks from the past rounds that the communication and dissemination plan is a uh, kind of a difficult when the team is trying to put up, um, yeah, put up with the application form. So last month, the access to space for all held its first expert meeting. So during that expert meeting, we set a dedicated session to talk about effective outreach. So uh, what is effective outreach? So during that session, Yuen Wusa communication officer and our two past awardee from the Kibo Cube uh, project, they did a lot of uh, good uh, outreach activities. So they shared their experiment in how to conduct effective outreach activities. So uh, the presentation and the videos are available on our website. So please go through the link below and uh, to, uh, to, to watch the, the session and it will help you to understand what effective outreach activities. Yes, so next part will be the 8.2, the relevance to the sustainable development goals. So in this section, we ask applicants to describe the relevance between your project and the SDGs. So first, uh, what are the SDGs? So the 2030 agenda for the sustainable development adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015 provides a shared blueprint for peace and uh, prosperity for the people and the planet. So uh, it's hard, it's the core of the, uh, of the, yeah, 
2030 agenda are the 17 sustainable development goals SDGs. And under the 17 SDGs, there are uh, 169 targets described in detail what uh, objectives are expected to be achieved. So please visit the webpage uh, my colleague Hazuki just shared and to, to visit the SDG webpage to read more about the SDGs. So um, what links have been made by our awardees? So for example, um, our awardee in the seventh round uh, of drop test, they were involved in developing a low cost uh, ventilator for, uh, for the fight against the COVID-19 uh, in the past uh, two years. And uh, these uh, skills that the team were uh, acquired through this uh, job test project. And uh, also <clears throat> the Bartolomeo awardee, uh, a consortium from uh, Egypt, uh, Kenya, and Uganda, they are uh, developing a payload, which is called ClinCom, uh, which ClinCom is the, to uh, the camera to monitor the climate change that will be on board the International Space Station uh, Bartolomeo platform. So they are collect data related to the agriculture and water management in order to support the, uh, the uh, sustainable development and react against uh, the climate change in uh, especially East Africa. And last but not least, so the gender empowerment is among the key priorities of the initiative. So we strive to achieve uh, even yeah, more stronger uh, participation in the team that um, team has to be like gender balanced. So, so we encourage more girls to, uh, to be included in your teams. Okay, so <clears throat> in order to enlarge the influence of the initiative that uh, supporting the SDG, so we conduct several uh, interviews with our partners and awardees. And uh, as my uh, colleague Hazuki already introduced, we have now five uh, interview articles. So please go over those articles to see how the access to space or initiative support the SDGs and how these uh, uh, awardee project, they support the SDGs. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. So next part, uh, yes, this is uh, the last part I would like to introduce is the risk analysis. So in this part, I would like to introduce the uh, risk analysis uh, matrix as a very common tool in the project management and please use it to describe the risk that you may face. Um, this should maybe include some technical risks, uh, planning risks, and also some uh, risks related to the budget. I list a few examples here, but those are very, uh, just examples. Please uh, yeah, brainstorm and find out every risk that may occur and those may affect your experiment. So, Yes, so uh, with those, I think I uh, mainly go through every part of the uh, yes uh, application form. Um, so I will, yeah, uh, give the floor back to my colleague Hazuki. If you have any questions, please read, uh, leave in the chat box. Yeah, Hazuki, thank you. Thank you very much, Wenbin, for the detailed uh, explanation about the application form. Um, as Wenbin was explaining, we know uh, we are asking a lot of questions, but it is really to help you understand uh, the experiments as well. And uh, putting it in this format will help you explain it to the supporters, to your university, to anyone that you're trying to get funding from, um, an overview of the project. And uh, for us, it will really help to uh, get a better view of the feasibility, what you're planning to do. So. So yeah, we understand that it is uh, a quite a lengthy form. Um, I, we hope that you really uh, take time and yeah, put together all the information. Thank you very much, Wenbin. So yeah, thank you, um, Jack. Thank you, Wenbin. Um, thank you everyone for joining in. And yeah, we wish you luck with your applications. Thank you very much. Bye everyone.